Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I'm Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. Today, you asked and we're answering. Steroids, Buffalo, New York, mental health. We are covering it all in today's holiday mailbag episode. It's Monday, February 19th. Let's ride. Neil? Happy President's Day. Happy President's Day. How are you celebrating today? I'm celebrating by naming the four U.S. state capitals that are named after presidents. Jefferson City, Missouri, Jackson, Mississippi, Lincoln, Nebraska, and Madison, Wisconsin. I hate that you just know that. What about um, Bush... Bushwick or Cleveland? Cleveland's not the capital. Oh, God dang it. Columbus? No, that's a Columbus explorer. is the capital. Uh, Columbus is the capital, but not an explorer. Well... Happy President's Day to you. Today is a special holiday mailbag episode where you guys determine what we're going to talk about. We asked for questions last week. You guys filled up our inbox, and today we are answering them. Real quickly, though, to any new listeners out there who may have come across this podcast from our Mark Zuckerberg interview that dropped on Friday, welcome. It's great to have you. And to any old listeners who haven't listened to that Zuck interview, maybe add it to your queue after this because... It was awesome. From a Mark Zuckerberg interview to a reader mailbag episode. That's called range. But before we jump into this holiday episode, we have a quick word from our sponsor, Veeam. Today may be a bank holiday, but you know who isn't taking off? Theme. What do you want in a data security provider? One that takes holidays and weekends off or one that is always ready when called upon and protects your data no matter what? I choose Veeam, Neil. Got me all fired up with that speech. Sheesh. I'm ready to run, th run through a wall right now. If you feel like Toby, head to Veeam.com today. That is V-E-E-A-M.com today. Now let us get to these questions. The first one is from Denise. She asked, Toby, I am curious to hear your thoughts on the enhanced games and starting off with a banger for some background the enhanced games are this new rival to the olympics where athletes can take performing enhancing drugs it's got some big investors on board like peter Thiel, and recently the world champion swimmer james magnuson agreed to take a banned ped to try and beat the 50 meter world record toby will this embrace of steroids be successful i absolutely love this question i think about it a lot so i think as ridiculous as it sounds we're already kind of been living through an enhanced era of athletics. I mean, take that 50 meter world record in swimming that was set back in 2009 by a, a Brazilian wearing one of those extra streamlined suits. They eventually ended up banning those. But if you look at what's happening in running right now too, the shoes have progressed to such a level that records are falling left and right. So I do think we're moving into a world where the line between normal athletics and enhanced athletics is blurring. Obviously that line has been drawn at steroids and at performance enhancing drugs, but I do think that it's going to become more acceptable. So even though if right now this is a bit of a stunt, a bit of a sideshow, I think that's the direction we're moving, weirdly enough. Yeah, and do you think that records will be broken through steroids? I know, I know a lot of us know it through baseball and what happened there, but we don't really know its Im impacts on the body. A lot of doctors say this is bad for your health, obviously. Is, you know, will by taking performance enhancing drugs, are these records going to be shattered completely? Like, if you go to, the, if you look at the enhanced games, are they just going to be shattering world records by five, ten seconds? Uh, definitely not, though, because I do think steroids take you from. 95th percentile maybe to that extra 5% and which is all that really matters in these games it's not going to be massive massive margins or anything like that you still have to be just an incredible athlete because I mean there was that documentary Icarus where a normal person tried to get on a blood d doping uh, scheme to see how it would uh, influence his cycling times and he went from average to like slightly above average so it definitely still matters who the person taking the drugs is. And so I don't think like you or I could slap some PEDs in and start running 100 meters in under 10 seconds. So. I don't plan on it. <laughs> I, I plan on it. I want to give it a shot. Okay, let's go on to our next question from JR. If you were to start a company right now, which industry would you want to be in? Easy for me. Elder care. I think anything with helping older people live better lives these days 
This is going to be a huge industry. The baby boomers are aging out of the workforce. There are so many of them. You see the silver economy, so you know what it's called, booming in places like Japan, uh, where there's a lot of people getting older. I think this is going to be a, f a huge phenomenon as birth rates slow. So anything that has to do with serving the elderly community, people 65 and older, I think is a really interesting uh, industry and space to be in. I just only see it growing. And, you know, there's growing interest in longevity research, people trying to live past 100 and a lot of investments in health in that respect. So that is kind of an industry that I see really growing is, now. Is there a specific part of it, though? Like that is still pretty broad or is it no. longevity specific? Oh, you just want you're just skating to where the, the puck is. Exactly. Going exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm on that note. I will pick a specific industry. I think pickleball is going to pop off. I mean, we've talked about it on the show. It's much maligned by some people, but it is a huge, huge sport for kind of elder baby boomers. It's it's very fun for people of all ages. I'm clearly biased, too. I'm working on a pickleball shoe company as we speak. So I think that under the elder care umbrella, I'm targeting pickleball specifically. Okay, next question. Brittany asks, do you have any suggestions for a stock newbie to get an idea of the basic terminology used when referring to stocks and the market? I like that you cover it a lot, but honestly lose focus when the terms come into play. I feel like this is something that both you and I have a lot of experience with because before we came to work at Morning Brew, neither one of us had huge business backgrounds. I mean, you were a history major. I was a... Um, English major. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't even remember the English words right there. And so I think we just learn from it by how you learn anything else, reading, immersing yourself in the world. Hopefully by listening to us, you get a better understanding or by reading Morning Brew. Like th these are two very accessible resources to a lot of people. So I would just immerse yourself in the world and that's the way to learn about anything. Yeah, just repetition. I mean, I did not know coming into Morning Brew what an IPO was. I didn't know why Warren Buffett was uh, famous. So I just read, uh, I just read a ton and through osmosis over the years, it takes a while to understand all of the concepts. But if you're a curious person, stocks and finance is just like any other topic that you can you can definitely learn. I know it's I know, I know it's extremely intimidating. It was to me, it was to you, but we uh, we got through it. And obviously I don't think I mean we're we're not not experts, but we there's still a lot of a lot for us yeah, to learn. It's kind of just however deep you want to go too. Like you can go really deep and really get into, I mean, like earnings per share of it all and price earnings multiples and stuff like that. Or you can just look at the general market cap size of a company and get a sense of like how big this company is. So it really is just depends on your personal preference and how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go. A lot of financial platforms out there do have resources. Mm -hmm. Wealthfront, Robinhood, all of them. You know. Have have really good resources that kind of explain these concepts and break them down very quickly. Morning too. Brew as well. If and you Morning just Brew. Google stock market explanation from Morning Brew, we got one as well. Um, this next question is from Monica. You guys have talked a lot about how certain cities are becoming more popular now as cost of living drives people out of the so-called tier one cities. I remember you cited Buffalo at one point as the hottest up and coming real estate market. What other cities do you guys think are on the upswing? Yeah, great question. I think about this in terms of uh, what criteria do you look for in an up and coming city? I think having a strong university system is always integral. You want to have a good airport, affordable housing. But one region that I think is going to blow up if it hasn't already, Northwest Arkansas. And I know everyone's going to laugh, but if you don't know Northwest Arkansas, it is booming right now. Walmart is headquartered there in Bentonville. You have University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. This is an area that is, is booming. You're close to the Ozarks as well, so there's a lot of nature nearby. It's relatively affordable housing. And so I think Northwest Arkansas, the people who live near Northwest Arkansas are in it are, are nodding their heads right now because they know that this place is getting super hot. But for people who don't live there or never really heard of it, I think it is going to become a super hot spot. There, I, my mom took us to a vacation there like seven years ago. Oh, so you're looking at my this. whole family was like, "Why the heck are we going to <laughs> Northwest Arkansas?" So I think we were in it before. It 
before it took off. Maybe you have rose-colored glasses then, because we all have that one vacation that presented an area very, very well. well I'm not saying it was like the most exciting yeah. uh, vacation. So there, there's a what famous a art museum there that was started by Alice Walton of mm. of the Walmart family. She's a big collector. There, that's sort of the centerpiece cultural institution of the area. How's the weather though? I feel like that's an overlooked factor in where you're moving. I mean, maybe it's not overlooked actually, but is the weather hot? Is it part of like that Sun Belt area? I don't think it's. You're as you're hot. my expert here. It's you close tell to me. the mountains. I have no idea what the weather there is. <laughs> it's Arkansas. It's definitely not as cold as here. So I would say maybe moderate, but I really don't know. You know, I. I don't know the the weather down there. <laughs> All right, before Frankly. we sh uh, before we shift into the next part of our show, which is some more personal questions, we're going to take a quick break. Okay, this next question from Jacob is a fun one. If you could have dinner with one person, who would it be? Well, I'm going dead or alive here, and if I could have dinner with one person, it probably would be Anthony Bourdain. I don't know. He was someone I really admired. He cooked you a fine meal, obviously. Plus, he just have incredible stories from all over the world. He's someone with such a unique perspective. Whenever I watched him on TV or read his book, Kitchen Confidential, he had just really unique perspectives on things. And he got into jujitsu late in life, so maybe we'd, you know, <laughs> grapple a little bit. So. <laughs> I don't know. It, he's just a very fascinating person. Lots of stories. I'd love to pick his brain. That is all the essential ingredients of a great dinner party. Great stories, grappling in jiu-jitsu, and having good food. I do admire you for picking a chef, though, because that is 100% the right answer to this question. Pick someone who can cook an awesome meal and explain it to you. I'm going in a different direction. I would pick Elliot Kipchoge. He is the first man to break the two-hour um, B barrier in the marathon under that stage condition race. Just one of my favorite athletes of all time. But I also really like, he's got this monk-like outlook on life, both in his approach to running and his approach to life in general. Lives a very humble lifestyle, just kind of sweeps and tends to his house. And I think that it's so different from the life I'm leading in New York City that getting that perspective and seeing how he views the world would just be one of the most exciting dinner conversations I could have. And he probably cooks some cool, good food as well. I mean, he's an athlete, of course. Okay, this next one is from Edward. What was the most recent nonfiction book you completed? Please give us listeners a brief review and a recommendation rating. I'm going to cheat. I don't remember the last nonfiction book I read because we read so much news for work. I like when I read for leisure at home to just go into another world and read a fiction book. So I'm cheating. I'm sorry. I, there was a nonfiction book I read about Chicago, which I forget the <laughs> uh, I forget the name right now. I can look it up. But um, well, after Toby talks. But that was the last nonfiction book I read. For the most recent fiction book I read was Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami, which is a very famous famous book set in the 60s. It is sad as hell. <laughs> like, there's a lot of death. So if you're into melancholy and just reading sad stories, sad but beautiful stories that, you know, have a lot of redeeming characters, uh, this is a book for you. I mean, it's a very famous book. I give it a 7 out of 10. I've been reading so many books where characters kind of talk out of the side of their mouths, like they're manipulating people. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a secret agenda. In this book, everyone just says what's on their mind very directly to each other with no other agenda besides speaking truth. And it was just kind of, I was always just thinking throughout the book, like, oh, what's what's the hidden thing going on here? Like, is this a front for something? And it wasn't. So it's it was a very genuine, uh, genuine book. And so I encourage it to anyone who wants like a, a cry. I like it. I'm not a fan of the seven out of 10 rating. I think that's a cop out. That's what everyone says as like, yeah, Oh, it's good, but not too bad, but I'll let it slide. So I will answer the question. My, the nonfiction book I recently read was actually Elon Musk's biography from Walter Isaacson. I thought it was my duty as a business podcaster to actually read it. It definitely drags on a bit at parts, but it certainly gives you a better insight onto what makes Elon tick, which is a very important question for the world and society in general. I would give it a 6 out of 10. I would have given it a 7 out of 10, but yeah, it just drags in, in, a, in a few points. Okay, next question. Are you guys following, this is from Aiden, sorry. Are you guys following James Clear's habit advice and applying it to your life? I love this question. Just to add some additional context to Aiden's question, we did an interview with the author of the best-selling book, Atomic Habits, James Clear, at the beginning of this year, January 1st, actually. He broke down his habit forming system for us. Incredibly knowledgeable guy. You should definitely go watch our talk with him on YouTube or listen to it if you haven't already. But okay, Neil, enough preamble. What was something that stood out to you? The one thing that stood out to me and everyone I talked to who listened to this episode was James Clear told a story about one 
couple of his readers who went to the gym every single day, but for only five minutes. And that was th that was to his point of become put systems in place. So, you know, don't have an outcome oriented goal, have a process oriented goal. So the fact that this guy would just go to the gym for only five minutes meant that he was the type of person who goes to the gym. And that eventually led to this habit of going to the gym, even if it was only for five minutes. I think that was a anecdote that that stuck with a lot of people because it, it's it, it sort of de intimidized, if that is a word, the process of going to the gym or doing anything. Yeah, it stuck with a lot of people and stuck with me, actually, because I immediately implemented that into my life. My New Year's resolution was to run every single day this year, still is. And for the first two weeks, I literally ran exactly one mile 10 out of the first 14 times, partly because I was a little out of shape to start, partly because it was really cold out, but also that was in the back of my mind is just being the type of person who runs even one mile eventually set you off. Now I'm running a lot more than that. But yeah, I immediately flex. took that to my life. Yeah, a little flex there. Um, took that and implemented in my life, and I highly recommend it as like a way to to build a habit. Okay, following up from Aiden, actually, what keeps you up at night, Toby? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, first of all, I live above a freaking bar in New York City, so the live music they have on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday keeps me up. But also, just as a more uh, a real answer to the question, I actually fall... To fall asleep, I play golf rounds in my head, or or actually I go on runs too, and sometimes it backfires though because I get really into it and start like playing every shot, and I start scoring well, and it ends up keeping me up longer. I don't know if I'm the only one who does that, so please write in if you have like a routine or something you think about to help you fall asleep, but that's what's keeping me up at night. I also play golf rounds, but I can't figure out in my head whether I want to be Good or not. Right. Are you good when you play oh, golf absolutely. in your mind? I'm like 11 under through now. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. I didn't know whether to play to my score typically and like have myself shank a few shots <laughs> like I would typically it, or play really well. It's aspirational. I, okay. I don't know. Like manifest it. That's what I think. All right. This one's from Luciana. Can you walk us through a day in the life of Neil and Toby? Neil, take us away. All right, I'll do this as quick as possible. Toby and I wake up, I think around 4 a.m., get to the office, do some last-minute prep for our show. We record the show at 6, goes till 6.30. Uh, we go to the gym Shout <laughs> every out day, Blair. maybe sometimes for just five minutes. <laughs> Come back to the office, and then we have other jobs here at Morning Brew. Um, I help work with the newsletter. Toby does our social media, with, and we all have various teams. Uh, um, and then we read the news a lot, I mean, to figure out what we're going to work on and talk about the next day. Um, so that's kind of the morning and doing doing our various other tasks and meetings. Um, in the afternoon, we decide on a story slate for the next day's episode, the next morning. And then we plug in our headphones and get to prepping and reading everything there is on those particular subjects so we can sound articulate about it the next morning. Yeah, it definitely is cyclical and Groundhog day S because part of the issue for me with our schedule is that you're always kind of living a day ahead because you're always preparing for the next day's newsletter or the next day's story. So there are certain days where it's a Wednesday, but it already feels like a Thursday. And so it all, your time, your sense of time gets all warped, but it's very fun. Like we get, the only reason we're a lot, we have the energy to do this every day is because we absolutely love doing it. It's very fun learning about the world, diving deep into these topics yeah. for you guys. So it gives us energy rather than takes us away, which is why this schedule kind of, kind of works for both of us. And you don't know what you're going to talk about the next day. Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen in the world. So you wake up being is, like, I have no idea yeah. what the next podcast episode is going to be about, which is super fun and thrilling. Also a little stressful for <laughs> sure, but that's the way this job goes. That's the way of the, of the road. Okay. Uh, Alyssa's next question is what do you do to take care of your mental health? That's a good segue from what we just talked about. No, absolutely. Actually. Um, one thing that I found very helpful is to just observe what you do or who you interact with on your good days versus what you do and who you interact with on your not so good days. And then slowly try to fill your time with repeating the stuff that pops up on your good days and stripping out the bad. And it sounds really simple, like do what you like, but if you just start being more aware of like, okay, this person gives me energy, this person doesn't give me energy, this activity brings me energy, this doesn't, then you can start crafting your life in a more deliberate way. And that's what I found. Like I found if the days where I end up scrolling on my phone, like staying in my room for a long time, not good days for me. The days where I go out, get a run in, hang out with people, much more energy by the end of it. So I think just being aware of what kind of ticks your box boxes is a great way to uh, kind of start taking care of your mental health. Um, 
All right. We got our last question, actually. What are your favorite places to eat mm -hmm. in New York? That's from uh, Sarthak. So uh, this kind of harkens back to my Anthony Bourdain dinner request. But I am, I don't know, I'm, I guess I'm not a normal e eater. I like seeking out pretty adventurous places and uh, things that aren't necessarily the classic spots. So I think of this in terms of neighborhoods um, where I just like to go and wander around and eat some street food there. So Flushing and Sunset Park for Chinese Elmhurst for Thai, Jackson Heights for Momos, and Latin American food. I mean, Jackson Heights, you can get everything. I, it's just the best neighborhood place in the world. And then Greenpoint for Polish. So, I, yeah, I love just doing day trips to these neighborhoods, walking around. For a more normal answer, I live in Williamsburg, and there is a sandwich shop. I love sandwiches, Italian sandwiches, can't go wrong. Anthony's on Graham is excellent. Uh, it's a neighborhood stalwart for a long time. I think it's kind of overshadowed, but those sandwiches are are first of all massive and they are very delicious honestly my favorite thing to do is just be along for the ride like <laughs> sometimes i go neil like where should we go and then neil dives deep into his restaurant archives usually finds a new places so i genuinely do like just trying new places with other people who feel very passionately about them or just want to explore something new so i'm just along for the ride but you you like going out to oh, eat i absolutely love it yeah i Sushi, do it omakase big... i'm a big omakase guy absolutely all right that is our show for this president's day. Thanks for so much for all of your questions. You can send more questions or any thoughts on the show to morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com. Let's roll the credits. Bryce Beloff is our editor and producer. Raymond Liu is our associate producer. Yuchenua Ogu is our technical director. Billy Menino is on audio. I don't have anything for hair and makeup. <laughs> Devin Every is our chief content officer and our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show today, Neil. Let's run it back tomorrow.